One of the most famous stories of martyrdom in the early church outside of the New Testament is the story of the death of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. We know this story from the account written entitled The Martyrdom of Polycarp, which was penned, it is believed, around 160 AD. It's an interesting story because it is, in fact, the oldest written account of Christian martyrdom outside of the New Testament itself. And Polycarp is an important individual in church history because he was the last surviving uh, person to have known an apostle, having been, in fact, a disciple of the apostle John. Polycarp was 86 years old when they came to arrest him. His friends urged him to run out of the house, but Polycarp, Polycarp, uh, Polycarp, <laughs> stay with me, folks. Polycarp responded, God's will be done, and open the front door and let the soldiers in. By the way, previous to this, the reason Polycarp received the very soldiers who came to arrest him is previous to this, he reported having received a vision and told his friends, I must be burned alive. They took Polycarp and dragged him before the local proconsul who is Quadratus, who interrogated him in front of a large crowd of onlookers. Quadratus urged Polycarp to save his life by cursing Christ. But Polycarp responded in now famous words, quote, 86 years I have served him and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The magistrate was reluctant to kill such an old gentleman, but he had no choice. And as they bound Polycarp, to the stake, he was heard to pray these words. Lord God Almighty, Father of thy beloved and blessed servant Jesus, through whom we have received full knowledge of thee, the God of angels and powers and all creation, and of the whole race of the righteous who live in thy presence. I bless thee because thou hast deemed me worthy of this day and hour to take my part in the number of the martyrs in the cup of Christ for resurrection to eternal life of soul and body in the immortality of the Holy Spirit, among whom may I be received in thy presence this day as a rich, acceptable sacrifice, just as thou hast prepared and revealed beforehand and fulfilled, thou that art the true God without any falsehood. For this and for everything, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, thy beloved servant, through whom be glory to thee with him and the Holy Spirit, both now unto the ages to come. Amen. And they actually stabbed him to death before the fire was lit. Accounts like this and other accounts like it led the early church father Tertullian to make this profound statement, quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And it also led Peter to write these words in 1 Peter 4:12. The words we come to now in our series, Transforming Grace, which we are continuing for the next few weeks of November. Verse 12 of chapter 4 of 1 Peter says this, and incidentally, I did not plan that this Sunday we would be in these verses. I had no forethought about this being the day we would pray for the persecuted church. To God be the glory. Beloved, do not be surprised that the fiery trial, when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. 
but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter writes to Christians scattered throughout several regions who are just beginning to feel the winds of persecution and opposition in the Roman Empire. It would be a few more years before it would blossom into full-blown persecution at the latter reign of latter part of Nero's reign. And Peter is largely talking to Christians who are enduring the testing that comes with persecution, but his words make it clear that he's not limiting it to that. He introduces this section with statements that show us that what he envisions Christians going through, though it is largely focused on the suffering of persecution, is not limited to that. He refers to things Christians are enduring as, quote, fiery trials and tells them they shouldn't think it's strange when these things are happening to them. Indeed, he says these words because it might have been the assumption of Christians reading this letter that based on what Peter has already said, they will not be visited by these things. He called them God's elect exiles, his living stones, a holy priesthood, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And Terms like this might easily lead them to conclude that being God's elect special people, they would be uh, saved and spared from such difficulties. Yet if that is what they concluded, they could not have been more misguided and deceived. Instead of an easy life, being a Christian in Asia Minor in the first century, they were finding the complete opposite. Difficulties, struggles, trials, suffering seem to abound. And Peter's purpose in writing in this section is to tell Christians and remind them these things are not to be unexpected. If you're a Christian in this world, this is normal. And by the way, which I hope to do in this pulpit one day or wherever we are, uh, I want to teach the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation was written specifically not to help us nail down the date for the rapture. But it was written to prepare Christians in Asia Minor, same area, that they would indeed suffer and it was the will of God that they do so in a majestic picture in Revelation. And I better be careful, because if I get on this, we're done. Jesus alone takes the scroll out of the hand, the right hand of him who sits on the throne. And this picture is intended to tell us that all sovereignty, all affairs on planet Earth are now guided by the Lamb. He's in control of history. When the seals are broken, history unfolds. And guess what? It is not haphazard. It is not coincidental. It is not accidental. The Lamb reigns. 
And when he breaks open the first seal, a white horse comes galloping out. Contrary to popular opinion, it's not Antichrist. It's the white horse, which is identified later in Revelation as one who sits upon a white horse, none other than the Lord Jesus and his gospel. And when he breaks the seal, the first force released into the earth is the power of the gospel going out, conquering, and to conquer. But it is immediately followed by a red horse, which John is told is a horse that causes conflict and takes peace from the earth. Wherever the gospel goes, John wants his readers to understand, and Jesus wants his uh, followers to understand, that when the white horse of the gospel gallops forth, it is always followed by the red horse of death and persecution and suffering. In fact, the word sword, which is in the hand of the one sitting on the red horse, is not the sword of warfare that nations would use in battle. It is, in fact, the sacrificial sword. John is saying the red horse of persecution always follows the white horse. Now, Peter tells us something in our passage this morning that's amazing. And my aim in this short message is to try to get you and myself to live this way, because there are men and women in this room right now that are engaged in fiery trials. I'll speak to that in a minute. Because Peter's purpose is not only that we would passively accept them, you know, sort of be resigned. Okay, I got to suffer. Hallelujah. Not at all. Peter tells us not only that we should be prepared to accept these things as commensurate with gospel faith, but we should be rejoicing in them. And brothers and sisters, this is either the height of lunacy or Peter wants us to know something about our difficulties, trials, and sufferings that give us the basis to rejoice in them. Peter tells us that our sufferings have two components that you must understand. And all of our brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution this morning should understand. First, it is that we are sharing in the very sufferings of Christ. And secondly, we must understand something, that our sufferings, which we presently do, 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 uh, are, are uh, experiencing, do not destroy us, but indeed purify us. Let's start with the sufferings of Christ. First of all, we know that Jesus suffered in his life and in his atoning death. And his sufferings were totally unlike ours. The sufferings we endure in this world are not the sufferings of Jesus for atonement. They're not for atonement. They are, in fact, sufferings as we bear witness to the gospel in a fallen world. And even though Peter is talking largely, as I said earlier, about the suffering of persecution, but he's not limiting it to that because in verse 19, he talks about suffering according to the will of God. Now, I've said this before, and please understand this. If you choose suffering, you're sick. This is not a call to be a person who's looking to suffer. That is not a Christian posture. What it is, is not that we choose suffering, but that we choose the will of God and we recognize that if we do the will of God in this life, we will suffer. Paul says it this way, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. It's 2 Corinthians 1. We partake of Christ's sufferings in this world not by uh, his sharing in his atonement, but by following him in a sinful world. And there are plenty of examples I could give, some of which the people sitting in this room have experienced and may be now. A man is mocked and laughed at at work 
because of his Christian testimony. And while all the guys are laughing and telling crude jokes, he is quietly praying and reading his Bible by himself. A young man in his college is mocked for his virginity and for his stand for purity. And he is laughed at and called names. A young Orthodox Jew has his parents light a candle for him, pronouncing that he is dead because he has gladly announced that he now believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Somewhere in this world today, a young Muslim woman is threatened by her father that he is going to kill her if she doesn't renounce her faith in Jesus Christ. We share abundantly in this life the sufferings of Christ. And if we intend to be a bright witness in this world, we will suffer. But as I said earlier, these things, these sufferings which Peter speaks of are not limited to our being persecuted, but include trials of any sort and every sort. Peter calls them fiery trials, and he uses a word for burning when he describes it as fiery trials. It's the Greek word purosis, from which our English word purify is derived. Peter is actually saying that God is using pressure, difficulties, trial, suffering to purify us. And he says these things are coming upon us to test us. The word test there was used of the way in the ancient world they applied pressure to metals to test the solidity of a metal like gold. And so what Peter is saying is God allows difficulties to come upon us, to test us, to put weight on us, to put pressure on us. And when he does, we discover what's really in our hearts. You know how we sometimes when pressure's applied and something comes out of our mouths that really is untoward or unkind towards another or your spouse, and, and you say, I didn't really mean that, I'm just feeling pressure. But the point is, the pressure made you say what you really feel. And Peter isn't the only apostle that teaches that God uses trial and difficulty to test us, to purify us. James would agree with that. When he opens his letter, here's what he says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. He says there's trials of various kinds. As I pan the audience this morning, you're not going through what I'm going through, but you're going through things if you're a Christian. There are various trials, and Paul agrees with Peter. In his fifth chapter of the book of Romans, he says this, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Both Paul and James say we can rejoice because we know something about trial. We know something. We've learned something. That God is at work in our difficulties, trials, and even our sufferings, and that his sovereignty allows him to use these things to purify us and change us so we become conformed to his holy image. So Peter and James and Paul tell us that far from being sullen, and I am guilty of that, and downcast about our trials, he tells us rejoice. Thank God. I believe there's a God right now that if you would ask him, I want your best, he would say, if you're a Christian, you already have it.
Maybe an American gospel would tell you you don't, but God's word would say you do. Why can we rejoice in these things? Two reasons. Number one, they are evidence that we really belong to Jesus and we are given to share in his sufferings. It's not like he has his sufferings, we have ours. Peter and all the apostles say they are the sufferings of Christ. But there's another neat reason you can rejoice. And church, I have to tell you this. If you don't have this perspective, you will never, ever be able to rejoice in your sufferings. And it is these very difficulties are preparing us for a far greater weight of glory to come. The Apostle Paul, again, in 2 Corinthians 4, says it best, quote, and here's his perspective, for this light momentary affliction, doesn't feel that way, I, I take issue with you, Paul, it doesn't feel light, but it is, for our light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And in another way, in Romans 8, Paul says it this way in Romans 8, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, hallelujah, provided, the sentence didn't end, we're, we're heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. The reason you endure the things you endure is it not only prepares you by giving you an eternal perspective on your life, but it also stores up a treasure in heaven when you obediently do the will of God in this life and it is difficult and you suffer because of it, you are storing up for yourself, I am storing up for myself, a rich treasure beyond words. But Peter says in this life our sufferings have meaning because we suffer according to verses 14 through 16 to bring glory to God. We glorify God when we suffer. And Peter reminds them that if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed for being reviled for that name. He tells us that insults cannot drive the blessing of the Spirit from Christ's disciples. I love what he says. He says when you're insulted, it is actually evidence that the... Uh, a spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now, how many know when I'm suffering, I don't feel like the spirit of glory and of God is on you when people are laughing at me? When I stood before hundreds of Jewish people in my original uh, initial evangelism, I used to go to the streets of Miami Beach and preach open air to crowds, and when they would spit on us and hit us with umbrellas, literally, You've never seen Jewish mothers with demons. They're amazing. And, uh, and they were hitting us and, uh, and cursing. In that very moment, I have to be honest, I did not feel the spirit of glory and of God. I felt, felt the spirit of fear and anxiety. There was one time at a parade for Israel, I was surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of angry Jewish people who were pelting us and hitting us with umbrellas, and I was, I, for a moment, I feared for my life. But Peter tells us that suffering not only leads to glory one day, it tastes of glory now as the spirit of glory and of God is on us. He's not talking, of course, about sufferings we bring on ourselves because of our stupidity. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as a, or as a meddler. Some people meddle at work and 
go off and evangelize for two hours, and then when their boss complains or fires them, they come to church, so I've been persecuted for Jesus. No, you were persecuted for being a thief. You stole your employer's time. That's not what Peter's talking about. But we may suffer as a Christian, he says. Which, by the way, is the third time in the New Testament the word Christian is used. You might be surprised to know that it's not the prominent term that was used, but it began to gain in prominence. Peter mentions three times it's used. The first, you will remember, was at Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas and the other prophets and teachers are ministering. And they called them the Christians, the Christianos. But they were not commending them by this term. They were not saying, these are wonderful people, they're like Jesus. It was a term of mockery. It was not complimentary. It was derogatory. The Christ followers. But Peter says, rejoice because you glorify God in that name when you are being treated the way the world treats you. Incidentally, since Christine alluded to it, it's time we open our eyes And it's time we be aware for our children's sake that these things are not just, didn't just happen to Roman Christians in the first century, and they're not just happening in red China or Cuba or North Korea. It's beginning to happen here in America. The name Christian is now being associated with intolerance, narrow-mindedness, bigotry, Christians are increasingly being viewed by the media, by the culture, as those standing in the way of progress and acceptance. We are learning to accept all and everyone without censure, and these Christians are not getting with it. We need help, and we're getting it from an unlikely place. Kelly Kinder sent me an article uh, this week. The present copy of Christianity Today, persecuted North Koreans pray for American Christians. Arguably the most persecuted church in the country, in the world, excuse me, North Korea. Report comes that Christians in North Korea are praying for American Christians. Listen to this. This is an article uh, by uh, Reverend Eric Foley. As Americans gather to pray this Sunday during the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, they should remember Christians in the world's most persecuted country. Reverend Eric Foley, chief executive of Seoul USA, says instead of praying for members of the North Korean underground church, Americans should pray with them. They don't ask God to deliver them from persecution. They don't ask God to deliver them from persecution. They pray that they'll remain strong and faithful in the midst of their suffering, he said. Foley says Americans may be surprised to learn that North Korean Christians often pray for people of the USA and South Korea. Listen to this, quote, they pray for us because they feel we are persecuted by our prosperity and it distances us from God. They pray that we will remain faithful to the Lord. We prayed for them this morning. They're praying for us and it goes on. Eric Foley gives his opinion that the storm clouds of persecution are gathering over America. And they pray that we'll be faithful but there's only one reason Peter says these things are happening. Judgment. Judgment. It's for judgment. God is a God of judgment, Peter tells us, and God is bringing judgment on this world. And he starts by first judging his own house and then the world. He cleans up his own house before he judges the world. Peter tells us that in verse 17 when he says it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. 
And by the way, do you know what the symbol of judgment is in Scripture? Fire. Fire is God's judging instrument or means by which he purifies. Fiery trials are what he brings to the house of God before he judges the world. I can't help but think that Peter is thinking when he quotes this statement, although he's probably reflecting a statement in Ezekiel, I think he has Malachi 3 in mind. Beginning at verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you will seek suddenly, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. When God judges, Fire is the means by which that judgment is manifested, and he says it begins in the house of God. These are the fiery trials that we endure. And though our trials, and I have so repented this week because I've been thinking about the persecuted church all week and reading accounts, and I am humbled because I complain so easily about the most minuscule things. I am upset when I get a flat tire. It can affect my day. And I thought of brothers and sisters who are languishing in North Korean communist prisons. Peter says, if we the righteous barely survive these trials, what will happen when God's fire comes to the world. He says it this way. It's time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? When Peter says the righteous is scarcely saved, he's not calling into uh, account, he's not uh, uh, talking about uh, the difficulty people have getting saved or, or that, that, that our security in Christ is somehow shaken. No, that's not what he's saying. The word translated scarcely is best translated by the word difficult. It would really say if the righteous with difficulty are saved. It does not imply uncertainty of the outcome, but the difficulty of the road that leads to it. One author said it this way, quote, God's purging of his people is not a process that takes place in purgatory after death, nor is it a punishment that atones for sin. Rather, his purging is the discipline of suffering and trials by which the faith of his people is purified as gold in the furnace. And there's only one thing Peter says left for us to do. I want to quote it, and then I want to tell you a quick story, and I'll end. Peter says you have to keep continually entrusting your soul to a faithful creator. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls. Now, you may be suffering for stupidity. This promise doesn't count. But if you're suffering in the will of God, you are to entrust your soul to a faithful creator. That means literally moment by moment sometimes to keep your head above water. You keep turning your life over to a God that is sovereign, who loves you, and your life circumstances you bring to God every detail knowing this, that if you are doing God's will, you can bear anything. Anything. And incidentally, you view it as an opportunity to bear the cross. 
You learn what a young Armenian girl learned over a hundred years ago in Turkey. Let me close and read this to you. In the 19th century, Armenian Christians under a Turkish Muslim government experienced a tremendous amount of persecution. The government lifted the ban on Muslims converting to Christianity in 1856. Then just eight years later, they began arresting these Muslim converts to Christianity. From 1895 to 1896, government soldiers killed up to 100,000 Armenian civilians in an attempt to kill every Armenian Christian within Turkish borders. Lawyers, doctors, clergymen, and other intellectuals were rounded up and charged with subversion. Many had their heads placed in vices and squeezed until they collapsed. Then the Turkish government set April 24th, 1896, as the day to kill the rest of the Armenian Christians. Nearly 600,000 Christians died on that day, but some escaped. One of those who escaped was a young girl of 18 who stumbled into an American camp. Are you in pain? A nurse asked when she arrived at the camp. No, she replied, but I have learned the meaning of the cross. The nurse thought she was mentally disoriented and questioned her further. Pulling down the one garment she wore, the young girl exposed a bare shoulder. There, burned deeply into her flesh, was the figure of a cross. I was caught with others in my village, she began to tell. The Turk stood me up and asked this question, Mohammed, or Christ? I said, Christ, always Christ. For seven days, they asked me the same question, and each day when I said Christ, a part of this cross was burned into my soul, soul, shoulder. On the seventh day, they said, tomorrow, if you say Mohammed, you live. If not, you die. Then we heard that Americans were near and some of us escaped. That is how I learned the meaning of the cross. This young girl learned the meaning of the cross through burning. And folks, that's how we learn it also. Not, thank God, by government authorities burning a physical cross into our beings, but by fiery trials that come our way. George MacDonald, I think, said it best when he said, quote, the Son of God suffered unto death not that men might not suffer, but that their sufferings might be like his. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's do this. Let's stand. Do not anyone, please do not leave. We're going to take up our offering in a moment. I want to close in this section of the service in prayer, have you sit, tell you a couple things before Tyler comes to lead us in our offering. We wanted the weight of the message this morning, which is in keeping with the day of prayer for the persecuted church, to really be front and center. Lord, we come this morning... And we thank you that you entrusted to us the privilege of suffering for your sake. Lord, this morning all of us are humbled by the fact that our difficulties are pale in significance to the things that brothers and sisters are going through all over this world, in China and Russia and North Korea and Iran. Lord, that we prayed for your people this morning and our hearts break that they have to endure. But this is the mystery of suffering and I pray that we in this church would glorify you in the fiery trials that we are tried with. 
Let us rejoice as you said and obey what Jesus told us when he said, we are blessed when we are reviled for your sake. And Lord, prepare us for whatever will come upon our culture. We are not afraid because we know that we are going to entrust our souls to a faithful creator. Grant us grace in this, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated.